Looks like we got 25 people in the house. And it is seven o'clock. So with that, I'm going to uh, get this dog and pony show on the road. I used to say on behalf of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, I really can't say that anymore. On behalf of myself and, and uh, the folks that I'll mention in a couple of minutes here, welcome to the uh, live online uh, winter photography thing that I've now done probably four or five times. And it seems to be one of the more popular online programs I've done. So real happy to do this again. So welcome. So uh, my name is Matt Poole. And uh, for the next, this generally takes about 90 minutes because I like to talk and I like to show you lots of pretty pictures. Uh, we're going to talk about winter photography, at least as I understand it and promote it. So the first thing I'm going to do, everybody, is share my screen. And there is a chat box. So if anybody has any questions during the broadcast, uh, toward the end, I would invite everybody to unmute yourself. If you have questions, you can ask them then. But during the proceedings here, if you want to type a question into the box, no guarantee I'm going to see it because I sort of get tunnel vision here. But uh, if I don't see it or if I do see it, I'll respond to it. So I'm going to just kind of leave it that way. I am recording this session, by the way. So for anybody who uh, is hiding from the FBI or KGB, you might want to not show your faces because uh, this will be made available to folks that um, request the link uh, sometime after, after the fact. So here we go. Let me share my screen. I'm going to open up a PowerPoint uh, file. And that's what we're going to be doing uh, is operating from a PowerPoint here, since this uh, photography obviously is a visual medium. So folks, give me a high five if you can see a screen with a seal staring at you. Okay, great. So let's get going here. Um, this is just my opinion, born of, oh, 20, 25 years of photography, and I spent a lot of time doing it outdoors. So I will just share some of my own tips, tricks, and techniques. That's really the point. And I don't know it all and don't pretend to know it all. If I come across that way, please forgive me ahead of time. Um, this is part, this program tonight is part of the 18th, can't believe it, 18th annual Merrimack, Merrimack River Eagle Festival, which for that 18 years has been hosted or sponsored by the Massachusetts Audubon Society and Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. Um, as you know, Mass Audubon and Parker River have buildings right across from each other on that uh, very fine road on the way to Plum Island. So that's what this program is supporting tonight. Please be aware that according to the dates I see here, there are various Eagle Festival things happening now through the 18th of February, both in person and online. Who on earth am I? Well, I used to be called Ranger Pool. Now I'm just plain old Matt, although I kind of still play around with that title, Ranger Emeritus. Spent uh, 30 years working for the US Fish and Wildlife Service, five years before that working with the Park Service, and a lot of that time swinging a camera uh, just because it's a hobby. We all have hobbies, I hope all of you do, and it's the one that I was able to leverage the most in my job. Uh, the camera was used in many, many ways as was uh, teaching about it. So I'm a passionate educator and a passionate photographer. I hope all of you are passionate people that have joined me here tonight. Um, if anybody wants to get a hold of me as I put in the chat box, please don't hesitate. I'm more than happy to respond to emails. And it's right there, katieandlight at gmail.com. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, because I do kind of keep my ear to the ground, even though I haven't been down to Plum Island in almost eight months. I retired back in May and live up here in South Berwick, Maine with my wife. Um, as happens every year, there's a certain uh, fever that sets in among the photographers and to a lesser extent, the birders. Um, anytime any charismatic uh, raptor, like a snowy owl, or this year it's been uh, barred owls apparently, show up on a refuge, hordes of people show up to photograph them and to watch them and to just be honored to be in their presence and enjoy their majesty. Sometimes that collective response becomes problematic uh, in terms of trying to manage people behavior 
uh, in support of wildlife conservation. And it has been the barred owls this year down in Plum Island. And I know the staff and stay, stay in touch with them uh, pretty closely. And they are having a devil of a time with uh, people management down on the refuge, the point that they've had to take some additional steps to limit access to the refuge this winter. So just a reminder, everybody, that Parker River is a national wildlife refuge. It's there first and foremost for wildlife. People are a secondary element. I spent my career trying to explain that to people, but uh, that's why the Fish and Wildlife Service has that property in Plum Island and at something like, oh, 570 other units across the country. Um, they're there to provide habitat for wildlife conservation. People are generally welcome, but in a manner that is conducive to not uh, stressing these animals like the snowy owl, like the barred owl, like the coyotes and other things that are showing up down there this winter. So I just remind everybody what the purpose of the United States Fish and Wildlife and its National Wildlife Refuges is. And if you see that little sign in the lower right here, which is a phony, I did that in my backyard. There are no blue birds on Plum Island as far as I know, but the point remains the same. Please abide by the regulations on the refuge and you and the animals will be much better off in the short and long term. So here ends my little uh, missive about uh, wildlife conservation, photography and, and all the rest. So let's get back into nature photography in winter. Tips, tricks and techniques. The challenges of winter, not that we're really having one this year. We've had a couple of little bouts, but by and large, I went for a bike ride today. It was 50, 53 degrees up here. So I don't know where winter is, but we'll, we'll go ahead here uh, with the understanding that there is winter around us right now. So what is a challenge in winter when you're a photographer? Well, it's cold. Who the heck wants to go out in the cold and uh, just be uncomfortable? Um, besides, there aren't many animals around, right? Winter time just they're gone. They've migrated away. They're, they're hibernating. They're sleeping under the snow. There's really nothing to see anyway. So why go outside in the cold? The days are short and I work. Well, some of you work. Uh, if you've retired, you're working a little bit less. But I can relate. Pre-end of May last spring, I didn't have a lot of time in the winter when the light was, you know, the sun was above, above the horizon. So it was kind of tough to get out and shoot in the winter just for that reason. There's no color. A winterscape is nothing but black and white and brown and blah, blah, blah. Um, I hope you're seeing that these are not truisms, but these are some of the excuses that I think that we all put in front of ourselves, obstacles that uh, prevent us from getting out the door in the winter with our cameras. So number one, there's no excuse for not being comfortable outdoors in the winter, provided you prepare for it. And so this classic photograph of the layer system that we've all been hearing about since we were children uh, going outdoors in the wintertime. It's a great way to stay warm. It works. When you get too hot, you can start peeling the layers off. Dress in layers. Dress in materials that will keep you warm and dry. Fingers, hands are a real problem in the winter, particularly when you're handling metal tripods, metal lens barrels, and metal uh, camera bodies. So how on earth do you keep your hands and fingers warm during the winter months? Or can you? Well, of course you can. And you can do so by spending a lot of money. I think last year when I stole this picture, the lower right picture of those black gloves that are made specifically for photographers, I think those were like 75 bucks at B&H Photo. I wouldn't spend 75 bucks for something like that when you can use these wonderful Good old, good old fashioned rag wool uh, mitten gloves like I've got on here up in the upper right corner. They work great. You can get them for 10 or 15 bucks if you uh, shop online. And they're great when your fingers are not, are, are not needed to be exposed to the air. You can just flip the top of the mitten back over your fingers. And I think they work really, really well. Um, I learned the hard way one year uh, for, for one thing. Photography is not really a classic buddy system. Uh, a lot of us like to go out and do it by ourselves. And I certainly uh, don't mind being out there with other folks, but I do enjoy going out by myself. And sometimes I'm the only idiot that wants to go out the door at four in the morning in the middle of the winter. One year I went up to uh, Portland Head Light, 
near uh, <clears throat> in South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, actually, to shoot the sunrise. And I climbed down the rocks almost in the dark below Portland Head Rock uh, uh, Light, where you're not supposed to be, by the way. And uh, I didn't have this kind of thing on my feet that you see on the left. I just had a pair of hiking shoes. And of course, it was low tide and the, the black algae was all over the rocks. Long story short, uh, I went butt over tea kettle, as my grandmother used to say, and ended up busting a knee and had to get surgery. Had I had these things on my feet, these yak tracks, and there are other companies that make them, um, I would have been far less likely to have taken a tumble on those rocks. So put something on your feet that's going to give you some traction on ice and snow and other slippery surfaces. Um, regarding staying warm, I've got a drawer behind me. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of these hand warmers and toe warmers uh, in the drawer that people have given me as stocking stuffers over the last number of years for Christmas. Uh, I'm told they work really, really well. You can put them in your uh, mittens and gloves. You can put them in your pockets. You can put them in your your boots and your socks. And apparently they work really, really well. I've never used them, but they're cheap. And it's another way that you can stay warm in the winter. So I just thought I'd point that out. I've run into lots and lots of people who swear by them. Um, you have a, you know, if you're outdoors, just like that snowy owl that we're trying to keep calm and not flying around in the cold air, you're burning a lot of calories when you're outside in the cold. So why not bring a snack with you? Why not bring something that you can feed your personal furnace so that you can stay comfortable longer outdoors in the winter. So that's important. And one thing I always have in the car, I usually have two or three of these because oftentimes you are in reduced light situation in the winter time. Uh, I always have a, at least one headlamp with me. So those are invaluable when you're trying to see camera controls and other things around your camera. Uh, during the, the darker periods when you may find yourselves outside shooting nature and wildlife. The uh, camera products, camera product lines have really changed significantly over the last couple of years. In the old days, and I think you can probably see my, my cursor, um, I may use it occasionally to draw your attention to something. Um, the traditional camera that most of us grew up using uh, it's called a DSLR, a digital single lens reflex camera. It's the classic camera that you see on the right here that had interchangeable lenses. And while they certainly are still around, um, they have been really kind of put in second place by this thing called a mirrorless camera. Um, they're pretty much similar to a DSLR from the standpoint uh, that you do have interchangeable lenses. The big difference, and you can see it right here on this PowerPoint slide, is the mirrorless cameras are much smaller. They're much lighter. And so as a result, and they're just as good as the digital SLR, as a result, um, Nikon and Canon and Panasonic and Sony and a whole bunch of brand names uh, all have now um, very good mirrorless cameras. I recently, just in the last year, made the switch from a Nikon DSLR, and I'm now using one of their very fine uh, mirrorless camera bodies. So just to point that out, there are, there are two types of cameras that have interchangeable lenses now, and you will hear that word, if you haven't already, more and more mirrorless. So I've talked about the two dominant camera types. Um, probably like many of you, I use other cameras as well. So, yep, I've got one of those drones that I bought a couple of years ago, and they're kind of fun to play with. It's a little gimmicky. Um, they've gotten a lot cheaper, but it's a bona fide camera, and you can do some really nifty things with it. Uh, if you're a real estate agent, you can really do some nifty things with a drone. Um, there's the uh, so-called action cameras. Uh, the, the primary or probably well, most well-known brand is the GoPro, um, and I've got a couple of those. And then, of course, we all use this probably more than any of the camera types that I showed you, um, our smartphones. Boy, they have turned into really good cameras just in the last three or four years. I would not have said that three or four years ago, but uh, they really are stepping up and they're, they're, they're not as good as a camera. I'm not ready to say they can replace, replace any of those cameras that I mentioned already, but they're pretty darn good, most of them. So one of the things that uh, we always harp on when we teach the fundamentals of photography 
uh, and I hope you agree with this, the goal of having or creating sharp images. Uh, I don't run into too many people who have as their uh, mission in life to create blurry pictures. Um, I don't think I've ever met anybody who wants to do that. So let's, let's emphasize this, this goal of creating uh, sharp images. How do you get there? How do you create a sharp image? Well, there's a number of ways of doing it, but very simply, uh, one way to get a sharp image is by getting the camera the heck out of your hands at the time that the shutter opens and closes, takes the picture. Because if you're hand holding a camera when you take a picture, you are, I don't care how steady you think you are, uh, maybe you haven't had coffee in a week, you think you're rock solid. Well, guess what? You're not. You're introducing some perceptible level of blur into the image simply by holding the camera. You can't avoid it. Um, you know, how much blur is of course relative, but if you really want a sharp image, get that camera out of your hands so you're not introducing any camera shake. And so there's a whole range of ways to do that, of course. Um, this tripod, you see this fellow on the left, that's sort of the classic way. Put your cam I, You can even put a, a smartphone on a tripod. I've got a bracket that I routinely do that with. Um, you can put your camera on a bean bag. Uh, whether you buy one of these expensive uh, b &H photo or similar uh, specifically made for the photographer bean bag, or you make one by putting some dried beans into a sock. Uh, that's, a, that's a poor man's way of getting there. Or you use something called a monopod, which is essentially a tripod minus two legs. And that's what this gentleman on the right side of the screen is using. Each of these devices, and there are many others, are, are a means to get the camera out of your hand at the time the shutter opens and closes and the image sensor records the image. That's a great goal. doesn't matter what kind of camera you're using. So let's just talk for a moment about tripods. Um, this tripod, uh, most, most of the cheaper tripods, including the type of tripod I have, is made out of metal. The tripod legs that I have are made out of an aluminum magnesium alloy. The other type of tripod, and I have one of those as well, they're much more expensive. They're made out of carbon fiber. And so the tripod in the middle here is one of those uh, classic tried and true metal tripods. The one on the right here is a far more expensive by a factor of about two carbon fiber legs. Um, the nice thing about the carbon fiber is they don't get quite as cold in the winter as the metal tripod legs. And so what I'm trying to show you here in the two photos on the left, they do sell tripod leg covers. And now you can spend money for these fancy looking tripod leg covers on the left, or you can sort of take my approach and many other people's approach, which is go down to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy some cheap extruded foam pipe insulation and wrap that around your tripod legs. And it works just as well as the fancy pants uh, tripod leg covers over here on the left. But if you have metal tripod legs, you're probably gonna want to uh, cover them up with some, some type of insulation. Um, the other way of getting to sharp images is by paying attention to certain camera settings. Now, the sharper the, to get to a sharp image, your goal is always to minimize the amount of time that the shutter is open, okay? That, that camera shake that I'm, been, I've been droning on about here occurs, you're holding the camera, and when, you, when the camera shutter opens, um, it's very susceptible to any sort of movement that's caused by you holding it. So it makes sense, I hope it makes sense to you, is if you can minimize or decrease the amount of time that shutter is open, there will be less time for the hand holding of the camera to add blur to the image. So in other words, what you're really shooting for here is a fast shutter speed. The faster that shutter opens and closes, the least impact you will have in terms of camera shake, okay? So what do you pay attention to? You can set your camera to shutter priority. There you actually tell the camera how fast to open and close the shutter. That's one way to do it.
Um, you can set a very wide aperture. Aperture refers to the, the diameter or the relative size of the hole. When your shutter opens, there's a hole through which light goes through, hits the image sensor inside the camera, and then the image is recorded. I hope it makes sense to you that the wider that aperture, the more light's going to come in, the quicker that shutter is going to open and close. So use a wide aperture. That's another way to do it. And then finally, and I'm not going to drone on about this ISO thing, there is something called ISO. And you'll see a menu item or even a button perhaps on your camera labeled ISO. What ISO is, it's a reflection of how sensitive your camera's image sensor is to light. Now that sounds very sort of technical and so, sort of abstract. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. This is what you need to remember. Um, the higher the ISO, the faster your shutter is going to open and close. The lower the ISO, and this is something you can set on your camera, the longer the shutter will be open. Now, why ISO is a control you really want to be aware of is that when you're shooting in low light situations, and that's often the case in the winter, if you're out early in the day and late in the day, you may be shooting in darker conditions. If you, if you want the shutter to open and close faster, and it's going to need to, if it's darker, you need to elevate or increase the ISO. It's very common in darkly lit conditions, whether you're indoors or outside toward the end and beginning of the day, to boost your ISO so that the shutter will open and close faster. Okay, I could go on and on about ISO, but that's just something I would, I would look into if you're not familiar with it. Finally, and this is the case with most DSLRs and mirrorless camera bodies that you buy today. Either the camera body itself or the lenses that you attach to the camera body will often have built-in image stabilization. It's almost a gyroscopic technology that's built into either your camera body or your lens. And what that does, what that image stabilization does, is it counteracts the camera shake that you're introducing by holding the camera. So be familiar with your equipment and whether or not your camera lenses and or camera body has this image stabilization technology built into it. All of these things that I've talked about, the tripods, the camera settings, and image stabilized camera bodies and lenses all help to contribute to giving you sharper images. That's the whole point. Um, <clears throat> winter time, particularly if it's not super, super cold, uh, can be wet outside as it can be any time of the year. You have, many of you, thousands of dollars of electronic equipment that really doesn't play well with moisture, let alone rain. So there actually are raincoats that you can put on your camera body if, and your lens if you find yourself outside in lousy conditions or you start outside in good conditions and then the weather heads south. It's good to have something that you can put over the camera and the camera lens so that you don't get any moisture inside of either. Just to be aware of, um, this little plastic bag affair that you see on the left side I bought two of those about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. I have yet to use them. Those are uh, disposable. I think I probably paid five bucks for them, but at least I have them. Um, more often than not, if it starts raining, frankly, I just put the camera gear away, but you don't have to. There are ways of keeping your, your camera bodies and lenses uh, dry in lousy weather. Now, this is a big issue in cold weather. Camera, uh, cold, bat cold air, for cold temperatures and lithium ion batteries don't get along very well. So number one, take always take at least two batteries with you because the chances are, if you're out in really cold weather, it's not gonna be very long before the camera, uh, the battery that's in your camera craps out just because it's cold. 
and you'll want to have a spare battery to put in that camera so you can continue on with your photography. Now, a very simple thing to do, which is what I'm sort of modeling here in the lower right picture, is I usually have a second battery stuck right in, inside my coat pocket, not on the outside of the coat, but on the inside of the coat. So my body is keeping that battery warm. And it's not unusual if I'm out four, five, six hours to be swapping those batteries back and forth several times. Cold temperatures will kill a battery uh, quicker than, than anything. So just keep that in mind. Um, one thing you wanna be very aware of is sudden temperature changes uh, with the camera lens. All you have to do is be out in super cold weather or just cold weather with a camera lens, and then you step inside all of a sudden, and what happens? Particularly if, if the air inside is not super dry, and it may not be, you'll start getting condensation building up on the lens. You may get condensation building up inside the camera body in the lens if you disconnect it or disarticulated the lens from the camera body. You don't want to get condensation inside a camera lens or inside a camera body. So just be aware of these sudden temperature changes. It can be a real problem. The really smart way to do it is if you're shooting outside, why don't you put your camera and lens in the camera bag and then bring that bag inside and there'll be much less of a sudden temperature change allow the uh, camera and the lens to get warmer, slower, and you're much less likely to run into this issue. Um, water can wreak havoc, particularly if it gets inside a, a lens mechanism. You don't wanna go there. All right, let's talk about lenses. If we're talking uh, in part here about wildlife photography, it's hard to not notice when you're at a place like Parker River National Wildlife Refuge or pretty much anywhere, uh, where people are shooting birds, and I call these bird lenses, these, these big prime telephoto lenses that you, I'm sure you've all seen, maybe some of you have them, 500, 600, 800 millimeter lenses, which by the way, can range in price anywhere from 10 to $20,000 or more. These are the uh, lenses or the big boy or big girl um, wildlife lenses, uh, but do you have to have them? rhetorical question. Do you have to have these to shoot wildlife pictures? The short answer is no, of course not. Or I wouldn't have put the slide in here. They're nice to have. And maybe someday if I save my money, I'll get one, but I'm not counting on it. So in the meantime, and this is a really cool thing that technology has allowed for just in the last seven or eight years. The fella on the left that's got that, I think it's a meerkat, right? Uh, sitting on that lens. That's probably a 12 or $15,000 lens, 500 to 600 millimeters, right? The lens that that young woman in the upper right-hand corner is using has got basically the same focal length, five to 600 meter, millimeter, and that's pretty good. That's gonna get you the same zoom or uh, magnification as the fellow's lens on the left. The good news is the lenses, that lens that that woman is using there, you can get anywhere from a thousand to $2,000, which I don't know about you, uh, particularly today with inflation, it's a lot better bargain than going out and spending twelve, twenty thousand $20,000. These are very good lenses. And again, it's been a huge quantum leap forward in the lens uh, biz just in the last seven or eight years. I currently am using a uh, Nikon because I'm a Nikon shooter. 200 to 500 millimeter uh, lens, which is pretty darn good. And I think I paid about 1500 for four or five years ago. So that's an example. But for some people, that's still a lot of money. And I would say it is a lot of money. So can't get by a slide like this without using that, that, that famous quote, the best camera and lens to use is the one that you have. Well, I hope that's obvious. But let's continue our little discussion of getting some zoom so you can get out there and grab that animal on the salt marsh or that duck in the ocean. You can, you can reach them with your lens. Um, the classic sort of entry point for wildlife photography when we talk about uh, a zoom lens is the old 70 to 300 millimeter zoom. Uh, you can still get these lenses. I have one. I take it out of the camera bag every now and then. 
if your goal is to shoot wildlife, in particular birds, you in many cases can get a shot at 300 millimeters, not 70, but this lens, as you can see there right there, goes from 70 to 300 millimeters. And so you can walk the Hellcat boardwalk at Parker River uh, during the, the migration season. And you can take pictures of migrating neotropical migrants uh, or native birds with that, with that lens. And you can get a lens like that for 150 to 200 bucks. It's a great way to learn the craft without uh, jumping in with both feet and mortgaging your future by getting one of those giant lenses. But I have a really good option here. And again, I'm not pushing any of these brands, um, but my wife and I both, oh, probably four years ago, Tamron, which is one of the third party lens manufacturers and uh, Sigma, by the way, is the other one, uh, came out with this really interesting super zoom that has a range of 18 to 400 millimeters. It wasn't a super cheap lens back then. I'm not sure what they retail for now. It was about 600. But this is a lens that's on my camera most of the time. And I've got a bunch of lenses. Uh, but this is a pretty good day-to-day -day carry around lens. It's got a pretty wide angle at 18 millimeters. So I, it's great for landscape photography. But if I see a loon, as I did yesterday in, in the harbor up in Rockland, I can pull that loon in at 400 millimeters. So this becomes a pretty darn good and relatively affordable lens to carry around and not have to have 30 lenses in my bag. So I just want to point out that there are, there's a whole variety, a whole array of very affordable lenses that do put you in the category of wildlife photographer if that's your goal. But let's take it a step further. Let's say you don't have a lens with some zoom or some magnification on it. Does that mean that you can't take wildlife pictures? Well, of course not. Here's an example. Um, and again, snowy owl mania is something we deal with, not just on Parker River, but everywhere where these things are around in the winter. So I took this picture a couple of years ago down at Parker River, right at the Hellcat um, observation tower. And there were a bunch of people down there photographing this snowy owl. Well, I didn't have a zoom lens with me. All I had was a, 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 just a government camera that had a, a very short uh, zoom lens on it. So I wasn't going to get, I was not going to be able to fill this, fill the frame uh, with this owl. It just wasn't going to happen, but that's okay. I viewed it as an opportunity, not an obstacle. So rather than that frame filling picture that everybody gets, and they all kind of look the same, um, I got kind of a neat environmental portrait of this snowy owl. I got the animal in its context. Um, even better, if you can get the animal in its context, doing something, feeding on something, showing some sort of behavior that tells you about its natural history. So again, the point here is you don't need to have zoom or magnification to take a picture of wildlife. This is, a, in some cases, a much more interesting picture, I think, than the bazillion pictures of snowy owls that fill the frame that we all see every day. I'll, I'll take it one step further, and this is sort of a compositional tip. Same picture, I just stepped back a few more feet, and I got these two ladies who were also there shooting this owl in my picture. So this is a compositional technique called adding a foreground anchor point. So what does that mean? Foreground anchor point. When you put an object, and I'm talking about a landscape shot here, which is what we're looking at. When you put some sort of an object in the foreground, whether it's a tree, a human being, a boulder or something else, it adds a sense of depth to the image. And I think if you compare that image on the left with the image on the right, you can see that there's a much deeper sense of depth, a much greater sense of depth in that image on the right than there is on the left. The other thing that those two women are doing without even knowing it is another compositional device called framing. Because they are standing on either side of that owl, they're simply being there as helping to guide the eyes of the viewer right to that snowy owl. Okay, let's talk about something really nifty called a circular polarizer. If you are a photographer who spends any time outdoors, winter or any other time of the year, 
I would wholeheartedly encourage that you uh, not walk, but run down to the camera equipment store and get yourself a circular polarizer. It is nothing more than a dark piece of glass. Actually, it's two pieces of glass that are sandwiched in a little metal frame. You attach it to the ends of your lens barrel and a circular polarizer just does amazing things for your images, or I should say it can do amazing things for your images. So here's some examples. Um, classically, what a circular polarizer is really good at doing, it can really add separation between white puffy clouds and a blue sky. It can make um, colors much more saturated. And if you're shooting through glass or, or through reflections on the surface of a water body, like a, a stream, um, the polarizer will cut that reflection down pretty significantly. So that's the value of a circular polarizer. Now, one thing I want to mention about polarizers, they, <clears throat> they work in relation to where you're standing and pointing the camera in relation to the direction of the sun. In other words, they have almost zero effect or impact if you're facing toward the sun or if the sun is directly behind you. They have a maximal effect if you are standing and pointing the camera 90 degrees to the direction of the sun. So just kind of keep that in mind. But it's a circular polarizer, like I said, is two pieces of dark glass and you, you can rotate one of those pieces of glass relative to the other. So when you're using a polarizer, you're twisting and turning one of the elements and you're looking through the viewfinder to see what sort of effect it's having on the scene. It's no more complicated than that. Uh, the other thing I will say about circular polarizers is that just like any other piece of camera equipment, uh, you get what you pay for. So you can get a, a pretty good starting circular polarizer that's going to be helpful and not destroy the quality of your images for about $30 for most lenses. You could spend hundreds. So like everything else, um, there's a whole price spectrum. So if you're going to buy a circular polarizer, do your research. Uh, thank God for Google. You'll, you can read about them all day long. Watch YouTube videos. The other sort of the downside of them is because you're adding dark glass in front of your lens, should make sense. By adding dark glass in front of the lens, you're gonna cause that shutter to be open longer, right? You're gonna have a slower shutter speed, usually by one or two stops. Worth looking into it, folks. Uh, the other thing I'll mention about a, a circular polarizer, if you're using one on a, whether it's a super wide angle lens, a fixed, a fixed uh, prime lens or a zoom lens that has a wide, uh, really wide, wide uh, setting on the on the wide end, you can get what's called banding, and, and you'll see this in the sky. A circular polarizer is designed to handle a certain uh, angle of view, and if you get too wide on the um, on the on the zoom lens, if you get like down to 18 millimeters, for example, you may find you'll see some uneven uh, banding of the sky because you've exceeded what that circular polarizer can handle. But again, I just wanted to introduce these. Uh, I think you can see with these couple examples, they're pretty valuable. And I always have one with me out when I'm outside. <clears throat> now, we are talking about winter and at least maybe it's wishful thinking. There's often snow on the ground. We haven't had a lot of that this year, but this is huge. If you're photographing a scene with snow, you don't want to end up with sooty looking snow, I'm guessing. You want snow in your image that actually looks like the bright white snow that your eyeballs saw. So this is good to know. Your camera has a brain, right? All of these cameras that we're using today, digital cameras, uh, have a light meter built into the brain. They have been pre-programmed when they see a bright scene to sort of dim it down a little bit. In fact, it's in the photography biz, it's called 18% neutral gray. But the point is every camera, unless you intervene and change the settings a little bit, is gonna give you gray looking snow, kind of dirty or sooty looking snow, like this example here on the screen I'm showing you. Unless you intervene 
by using something called exposure compensation. And this is a tool, if, particularly if you're doing outdoor photography, this is a tool you'll be using all the time if you aren't already. So I'm telling you a fact. If you're shooting snow and you let the camera just take care of everything, you're gonna get the kind of exposure that you see on the left side of this image. If you want snow that looks right or correct, you need to intervene and add some exposure compensation. So there's a setting on your camera. Usually it's a little dial or a little button where you can literally override the camera's brain and add some light. And when we talk about adding or subtracting light in photography, the unit is a stop of light. So for, for snow, you're typically going to gonna want to add a stop or two of exposure compensation. Now, the controls that you're really looking for um, will have this plus or minus symbol that's pretty much universal from camera brand to camera brand. So this is one of those situations where you need to go take a look at your camera and or your camera manual and figure out how you set exposure compensation. There were situations where you know the camera is going to create a bad looking image. You need to intervene and either add some light or in some cases you're gonna to need to subtract some light to get the proper exposure. Hopefully this makes sense. Look into how you set exposure compensation on your camera. Here's another example. This bison on the left, the person shot that image and just let the camera, camera's light meter take over and you can see what you got. A very dark bison and some really sooty looking snow. Uh, but the photographer knew this guy, Rick, knew that he had to intervene by adding a couple of stops of light, which is what resulted in that image on the right, a properly exposed picture of a bison standing in a snowfield. One of the, the coolest aspects of winter photography, as we all know, the days are short, but it's also the time of year when the sun is very, very low in the sky and can create this amazing warm, glow uh, informed light. So it's a wonderful time to be outside shooting early in the day or late in the day. So shooting during the golden hour or it's called or in magic light is something that is very virtuous about winter photography. Um, I, the warmth that, 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 that is created by the, the low hung sun is just really pleasing and very beautiful. The other thing though, and these, these factors work together if you're out to shoot wildlife, when are most wildlife or many wildlife species most active? The answer is during early parts of the day and late parts of the day when the sun is low in the sky and you're getting towards uh, sunrise or sunset. So it's another example of why you want to be outside at that time of the day. You'll see more. You'll see more wildlife typically. So let's talk about photographing wildlife and other critters. Um, I mentioned earlier that, and it's a myth. I hope you saw it as a myth. Why go outside in the winter? There's no wildlife. The animals are all gone. Well, no. And here are some simple examples of pictures that I've taken in the winter, whether it's been around Plum Island or up here in Maine, where I spend most of my time. Um, there are plenty of animals here in the winter time, plenty of raptors. Uh, if you talk to the staff at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, and they're, they're honest with you offline, they'll say there are too many raptors because it, it leads to that human behavior uh, challenge I was talking about earlier. I'm kidding about that, but there are animals. There are plenty of animals to photograph in the winter, and here's some of them. Um, this is a really lousy shot. Uh, I was driving the refuge truck down a refuge road on Plum Island one day a couple of years ago, getting toward the latter part of the day. And I looked out the driver's side window and I saw this uh, Northern Harrier flying over the marsh. And I happened to have my little government camera on the seat next to me. And I think it's an 18 to 300 millimeter. So it's exactly that lens that I was talking about. And I quickly pulled over, put my directional on and I grabbed a, what I call a quick grab shot of this Northern Harrier. Well, because it was only a 300 millimeter lens, I didn't fill the frame with this bird, but who cares? Because I got a neat behavior shot. Now it's not a very high quality shot. That bird is pretty blurry, um, 
but it's not bad. And it, it does convey a sense of what it's like to see a Northern Harrier. And they're very common uh, on a refuge, particularly in the winter. You'll see them all year long. Uh, it, it really gives you a sense of what it was like to be there. So again, you don't have to have that fancy lens and you have to have a camera with you is the other lesson. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show you here is there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of eagles around these days. I can I saw one in Portland the other day, up flying over the highway. They're everywhere. It's amazing. And so here's another example. This is a picture that I shot oh a year or so ago, this time of year, uh, over in a little harbor in York, Maine. And as you can see, there's a, a more of a silhouette of a bald eagle. Uh, sitting on that uh, osprey nest platform. Is this wildlife photography? I think it is. And because wildlife and human beings tend to coexist in the same world, I don't mind having a picture of a bald eagle with a boat in the foreground. Um, to me, it just makes it a little bit more real. So again, these are opportun opportunistic shots. You need to have your camera equipment. You need to be ready to act and react but you don't have to have the super fancy expensive equipment to get wildlife images, which is what both of these are in my humble opinion. Moving on with other critters that you'll see around here in the wintertime. And this is just a sampling. There are many, many more, but shorebirds on the beach, you'll see them in the winter. The Northern Mockingbird, turkeys are everywhere. You almost trip over them everywhere you turn around these days. They make pretty compelling subjects. Lots of ducks, lots of waterfowl and geese, uh, sea ducks. Uh, you can go pretty much to any harbor along the coast and find some sort of duck uh, floating around. Loons. I was in Rockland, Maine yesterday, listening to the call of a loon as I walked back from the, the lighthouse on the breakwater there. That's not something we typically think about. We think of uh, on Golden Pond with a uh, Catherine Hepburn and Henry Fonda up in New Hampshire, you know, the call of the loons. Well, I was hearing exactly the same bird uh, give the same call uh, in the ocean up on the coast of Maine in February. And of course, there's that snowy owl that everybody loves to see. And they, they really are majestic and wonderful. And if you have an opportunity to be in their presence, uh, consider yourself lucky because they've not been around in large numbers this year, that's for sure. Um, and they're absolutely gorgeous. I totally get why people get all excited about it. Um, and I like the positioning of this bird right next to that area close sign. Um, anyway, lots of ducks, eiders, and, and all the rest. There, there are just lots of birds out there that you can be photographing in the winter. So again, please get over this, this myth. Hopefully I've debunked it. If you haven't already debunked it for yourself, there's plenty of wildlife out there this time of year, even the, the Canada goose. And there are lots of them around, as we well know. Another snowy owl. I kind of like this, the, the counterpoint of this snowy owl sitting on a, on a berm at Parker River with the uh, blurred out humanity in the distance behind it. Um, compositionally, this worked pretty well for me just because the horizon line is about a third of the way down. From the top, you never want the horizon line right across the middle of your vertical plane, by the way. I'll probably mention it again later. Let's see how the white houses uh, blend or, or jive really well with this white bird. Just a very pretty picture. But again, I didn't fill the frame with this snowy owl. I just had a, a, a journeyman camera and lens with me. More snowy owls. <clears throat> really, really, really beautiful birds. Um, the coyotes have been around on that little island a lot this winter. Probably in reality, there's only a couple of animals. They move around a lot. But there are plenty of mammals, uh, plenty of mammals to be photographed, whether it's the gray squirrel who's stealing your sunflower seed or the, the foxes or the red squirrels or whatever, uh, chipmunks. If it gets warm enough, you'll see chipmunks. There are plenty of fur, furry critters that you can take pictures of, including these. One of the best Guaranteed places to, to shoot seals, by the way, if you haven't discovered this already, is at low tide in the mouth of the Merrimack River. You can either be on the north end of Plum Island or even better, be over at the Salisbury State Reservation. If you shoot from the Salisbury side, you're actually closer to the seals than you are if you're over on the Plum Island side. I've done both and have gotten much better pictures 
uh, from Salisbury. But I shot this probably with a 300, maybe the 500 millimeter lens. Uh, but at low tide, they'll be there. Um, and they're there year round. And so again, it's, a, it's another furry, charismatic mammal. And because you can't really get near them, they're not going to scurry off. You're not going to just stress them, cause them distress by standing on the, on the shore. Here's a, a thing I like to push, a, a notion that I like to talk about. Take a creative approach to photographing a common subject. There's nothing more common than a seagull, right? We, we can see them everywhere, uh, including in a McDonald's parking lot, picking up cold French fries that somebody's left on the parking lot. But <clears throat> how do you make a common bird like this? Or how do you create an interesting image using a common subject like this? Well, I like both of these. Um, in the upper right, um, I did something that I do a lot, which is to shoot a pair of critters or a pair of flowers or a pair of something. And I, I call it the echo effect. I make the image in the front or the image or, or the object in the front or the object in the back sharp and the other one really blurry. I could just have easily made the bird in the background sharp and the bird in the foreground blurry. This looks a little bit better. So again, creative ways of creating creating compelling images using a common subject. I like the one on the lower left a lot. I don't know if you remember a couple summers ago, um, we had, I don't know, about a week or so of really hazy summer air because of the fires uh, carrying that smoky, uh, carrying the smoke east. We had about a solid week where when you looked at the uh, rising sun in the morning, it popped out of the sky like a golden orb because of the haze uh, caused by the smoke. And so in this case, I happened to be at Salisbury, saw this uh, seagull standing on top of a kiosk roof and just positioned myself so I could get the bird and this orange orb in the same shot. And I like that a lot. So again, just thinking, you know, taking the time to think outside the box uh, and get a little creative with a common subject. Here's a shot that, frankly, I screwed up. Um, I was shooting this snowy owl, like so many people do, sitting on the ground, sitting on a dune or a stump or a sign or something. But at some point, this animal got up and flew off. And actually, it kind of flew off shortly after I arrived on the scene. And there were lots of other people there. So I reflexively picked up the camera. And this is the best shot I could get. I, didn't, I was, wasn't trying to get this image, but when I put my images on the computer later in the day, my eyes came across this and I thought, you know, yeah, it was a mistake. It was a reflexive response. But I like this image almost better than any snowy owl picture I have ever taken. Why? Because it's different from everybody else's. It's a behavior shot. And it just gives you a sense of, it's a very, it's, it's a powerful shot. It gives you a sense of how powerful and fast and strong this animal is. Look at those feet. Look at the talons on the feet. You don't need to see its cute little face to get a sense of awe. Anyway, and I'm, and I'm not bragging. I'm just sharing with you a mistake that turned out to be a pretty, in my view, pretty decent wildlife picture. So share that with you. Um, I was driving years ago down a refuge road in uh, Great Bay Refuge in Newington, New Hampshire, just driving the truck down a, down a refuge road. And I saw out of the corner of my eye, this, this red tailed hawk jump out of a tree and take off. And it's the same thing. I reflexively grabbed the camera, stuck it out the window and grabbed a very, very quick shot. And it's a, it's a, it's a terrible shot. It's a lousy shot, but it's a shot. So this is where keeping things and playing with them on a computer can be valuable. It's still not a great picture. Don't miss my point, but it is a behavior shot. More often than not, when we see these raptor pictures, they're sitting on a twig or they're standing on a roof or a chimney or something. What I really like are the action shots. And even though this was a way underexposed image and pretty fuzzy by bringing the image into Photoshop and playing with it a little bit, I was able to turn it into something that was worth sharing, maybe only as an educational shot, a behavior shot. Um, but that old adage of turning chicken blank into, into chicken salad is kind of the point I'm making. Um, don't throw them out. 
If you're into editing on a computer, give it a shot. Maybe you'll end up with something that's worth keeping. <clears throat> I've already talked about the ethical field practices of wildlife photography. I, I sort of droned on about that at the beginning, but this picture here uh, makes the case. And we've all seen much larger crowds than this gathering around a snowy owl. So I won't, I won't belate the, you know, I won't, I will not beat people over the head any longer. Um, but being around these animals does cause some stress and there are ethical field practices that are espoused and promoted by organizations like the North American Nature Photography Association. And that they're just worth, I mean, these are all good efforts to remind people to conduct themselves in a manner around wildlife in a way that doesn't cause them stress. That's what it all boils down to. Uh, and then we all remember this from a few years ago, right? That was a real funny thing that was being bandied about a couple of years ago with Bernie. Let's move on. So can you do wildlife photography in the absence of wildlife? And I would say yes. So here's a couple of examples right here. Kind of fun to figure out what walked through here before you got there. Um, so I would say sign or evidence of wildlife uh, is as fun in some cases as the wildlife itself. It tells you more about the animal's life, natural history. So whether it's tracks or a muskrat lodge in the middle of the winter or a nest that you cannot see during the time of the year when the, the trees are foliated, these are all signs on the landscape of the existing coexistence of wildlife. Uh, shooting things like beaver ponds in the middle of the winter can be really fun. These animals are active. You may, may not see them in the middle of the day, but you'll see their sign. Um, shooting snags like this, this dead tree here. I mean, all sorts of animals are potentially living in a tree like this. So again, uh, shooting other than the animals themselves is another form of wildlife photography. Um, I always stick these images in here because it's a great reminder to me, and I hope to you, that to become proficient as a wildlife photographer, you need to practice. And if you really want to practice a lot, doesn't it make sense to practice on critters that are habituated? In other words, don't run away from you, from people. And so these two critters, this horse and this pig, uh, live in that little farm right next to the Parker River Visitor Center. This is the Pierce Little Farm. And they have these MSPCA critters that I would several times a year stop in and see on my way home or on my way to work. And it's a great way to practice shooting pictures of animals. Because they tolerate your presence, you can do it till the cows come home. Pardon the pun. Um, here's a picture I took of, of some really amazing draft horses pulling a sleigh up in Vermont a month or two ago. Again, this is not wildlife photography, but how often are you around animals like this? If you're me, not very often. So I took advantage of the situation and took some nice portraits of these draft horses pulling this sleigh around the snowy field. Um, and of course, many of us, many of you live with animals. And so why not practice your camera skills with an animal that's really gonna tolerate your presence and maybe even ham it up a little bit. Um, this is Felix, this is the critter I live with on the left. And if you wanna shoot dogs, find a dog park. Uh, you, <laughs> this is Willard Beach up in South Portland, this dog in the upper right. People go up there, it's like a big social thing. And there, there are dogs running up and down the beach constantly. And you can get some great pictures of these animals moving at, at quite, a, quite a tilt and practice your, your skills with panning, following a subject as it moves and getting a sharp image of it in the process. Here's another cool thing to do this time of year. Uh, in Westford, Massachusetts, and an even better one out in South Deerfield, Massachusetts, there's a couple of butterfly houses. And if you really want to do something really, really fun, go to these butterfly houses and take pictures of butterflies. Um, this is really a nifty thing to do. It's a very comfortable thing to do, and you can get some pretty amazing pictures. So again, butterfly houses. My favorite is in South Deerfield, Massachusetts, but there's a pretty good one in Westford, Mass as well. Um, 
I love this image. It's, it's, it's kind of a silly image, but my wife and I used to, I haven't done it in a few years, we used to sneak into uh, Petco or PetSmart with our smartphones, and we'd kind of look around to see if any of the, the attendants were around, and then we'd whip out our smartphones and practice our animal photography on their captive critters, whether they're the, the parrots that were for sale or the, the parrots. But these, these lizards are, are wicked cooperative. They don't move very fast, and you can, you can really get some pretty cool images. So yes, that lizard was sitting in an aquarium at PetSmart, but I like it. Uh, you know, I was able to play with it on the computer and got an image I really liked. Backyard bird photography. I don't know how many of you are backyard, have backyard bird feeders, but it's a great way. Again, it's a great way of controlling the situation and getting really, really good practice shooting wildlife. And they are wildlife um, right in your backyard and maybe shooting through a glass window, which is most of the photography we do right here at our home is done through a sliding glass window at our bird feeding station. They don't have to be standing on the feeder. Optimally, uh, like these bluebirds are, are in some tree limbs that are just maybe 10 feet away from the bird feeder. But again, it's a great way to sort of practice your, uh, your bird photography skills. I mean, you can see in the little bird feeding station we have behind the house, um, we nailed a, uh, at different times of the year, I changed it out a lot. We, we nail a log to the top of that four by four post. And it gives you kind of a, a, a naturalistic looking perch. But that's where, that, that's where that blue jay picture was taken, right up here. It was a different log, but that's how I got that picture. So again, uh, backyard bird photography. Again, better if you can get them, not on the feeder, but in the trees and the branches and the limbs around the feeding station you would not know the difference. I mean, you could tell with the lower left, but these two, the Cardinal and the Junko, they could be anywhere, right? Bluebirds, our favorite backyard birds. All you gotta do is feed them those overpriced mealworms and you'll get bluebirds if you happen to have the right habitat in your neighborhood. Um, I always draw people's attention to this fella. Um, Back when we were running the photo club at Parker River, one I was always doing presentations about this and that. And I did a presentation about backyard bird photography and setting up uh, kind of modeling studios, uh, setups, if you will, that would bring birds in and you could photograph them and make them look natural. There's a guy named Alan Murphy, and I'm still on his email list. Um, he is the national master a backyard bird photographer. So for that situ for that presentation I did several years ago, I bought his $50 CD, which is basically an ebook. And I, you see a picture, a page from it right here on the screen. And he shows you all these different setups that you can do in your backyard to take these different types of pictures of birds. I'm just mentioning, I'm not pushing this, but if you really get hot and heavy into the backyard bird photography, this is sort of like the zenith of that type of pursuit. There's also a very, very good book that I picked up at Barnes & Noble quite a few years ago, but it's really, really good. If you wanna get into backyard bird photography, it's by a guy named uh, J. Chris Hansen, Secrets of Backyard Bird Photography. Um, again, it's basically a book full of recipes. He shows you lots of his photographs and then he shows you how he uh, prepared the setup to, to photograph these birds. So my recap of tips for photographing, for being a successful wildlife photographer, make sure the eyes are sharp. This applies to people and animals. And it's an inviolate, absolute gotta do. You can have other aspects of the body fuzzy or blurry, depending on what your point is, but make sure the eyes are sharp. If the eyes are blurry, the picture will not work. If you can shoot at the animal's level, the best example of this is I was walking out of the Refuge Visitor Center one day many years ago in the summer, and I noticed a slug uh, kind of very slowly making its way across some pavement. And I got on my belly, it was a snail, got on my belly with my smartphone. I got within about a, an inch of this critter and I got a great picture, but it's only because I got down on my belly and I got at his or her eye level, if you will, and shot the picture that way, shooting at their level versus shooting down on them. Um, 
Remember, environmental or behavior shots can be far more effective, far more interesting than that image of a bird that's sitting on a twig or a tree limb and it fills the frame. They're both good, but don't feel bad at all. If you don't have one of those monster lenses, you can still create great, meaningful, educational images. Uh, remember that many critters are more active early and late in the day. And if you really want to freeze movement, and animals tend to move, uh, use a fast, use as fast a shutter speed as you can get by with. A lot of people think that, and you saw this, I saw this on the refuge all the time, you see it everywhere. They're driving along, they see something off in the marsh that they want to photograph, they pull the car over and they jump out. The minute they jump out of the car, the animal takes off. You'll be far more successful most of the time if you stay in the vehicle. Use your car as a photo blind. Obviously, I'm just talking about pictures that you could actually get from a car, but the animals tend to be more habituated, more used to, feel less threatened by the presence of cars than they ever will by you and I the minute we get out of these, these uh, safe uh, vehicles. So keep that in mind too. And of course, the more you know about the critters and their habitats and their habits, the more successful you're gonna be finding them and not scaring them off. This is an important one, very, very important. This applies to people, this applies to pictures of flowers, and it certainly applies to portraits of animals. When you film the frame or even part of the frame with, let's just say it's an animal in this case, a bird, be very aware of your background. The, the classic example of somebody who's not paying attention to a background is a picture of another human being standing, let's say, in front of a telephone pole. And when you look at the picture of the person, they look perfectly fine until you notice there's a telephone pole growing out of their head. That's what I mean by a distracting background. Just be aware of all of the elements within the frame. All right, let's talk about photographing everything else during the winter. In nature, we've talked about wildlife, and I'll move pretty, face, pretty fast with this. Number one, water, whether it's snow, ice, mist, whatever, it's fascinating, endlessly fascinating. Whether it's freezing with a very fast shutter speed, the frothy wave on the edge of the shoreline, or slowing down your shutter speed, so you get this really velvety looking uh, sort of image of the same type of picture or the just amazing variety, depending on the weather, in wave formations where you really slow down your shutter speed so much so. This is a whole type of photography called, uh, uh, well, basically it's, it's slow shutter speed photography. And this is an impact that, I, I, this is something that I wanted to create. This is the type of image that you want to create when you create an image like this. And you're generally doing it, you do it by putting something called a neutral density filter in front of your lens. You really, really, really need to cut down on the light. So if the shutter stays open a very long time and you cr get this sort of ethereal watery effect. So I used in this case, something called a neutral density filter, very, very dark piece of glass. Sort of looks a little bit like this, like that circular polarizer I showed you. You screw it on the end of the lens barrel. You can barely see through it, through the, uh, through the, the, the viewfinder, but it's so dark, it keeps that shutter open a long time and you get this kind of effect. And I used it here too, same kind of a goal, same type of technique. And this is not for everybody, I realize, but I really like this kind of thing. Again, kind of a self-portrait of the photographer, as it turns out, that's where the sun was. <clears throat> ice, snow, the presence of ice and non-frozen water in the same frame. I love this kind of image. Um, really fun to do, really fun to do but I needed a fairly slow shutter speed in order for that liquid water to look kind of ethereal or soft or cottony in this case. Same thing here, 
This is uh, the Wildcat River up in uh, Jackson, New Hampshire in the middle of the winter. Um, neutral density filter to really slow down the shutter speed to create this silky effect in the water. This is a little conservation property right here in the town of South Berwick where we live. Um, again, same deal, slow the shutter down so that the water gives you this kind of silky effect. I really love this image. I was over at Salisbury National, uh, National Park, Salisbury State Reservation late in the day one winter, a couple of years ago. And I found these uh, shards of ice, almost looked like shards of glass. And it was really low tide all over uh, the exposed tidal area. And it reminded me of a lot of these images you see people take in Iceland. The only difference is those tend to be blue ice cubes. Here, because of the setting sun, everything had sort of a warm glow to it. But again, a very, very different type of picture uh, created in very warm magic light. Just another ice formation. I find icicles and ice endlessly fascinating. They can often look better in black and white. Uh, sea smoke. We had an opportunity to shoot sea smoke if you were brave enough to go out. I think it was the weekend before last. You know, it was that real cold snap we had where it got to be 15 below. Well, my wife and I were crawling around the coast of Maine uh, mid-morning. We could have been out at seven. Some, were out, some got out a lot earlier. But if you get the conditions where, the, where the, the air temperature is super, super cold relative to the temperature of the water, you get this sea smoke. And it's just fascinating uh, to photograph. Um, just another sort of ice formation. Ice patterns. The ice patterns, both of these ice patterns were photographed on the windows in my shop. Uh, you may find them, may have found them on your uh, car windows in the morning. I've seen them there. Can be fascinating to photograph. Um, the crystalline ice structures are just endlessly fascinating. So again, another type of winter photography. This image in the lower right is really kind of funky. Uh, it was taken with a smartphone, believe it or not. Years ago, when they were ripping out the old Hellcat boardwalk at Parker River, I went out there one morning and I saw this uh, exposed broken nail where they had ripped up some of the old boards and noticed that these really intricate um, ice crystals had formed on this rusty nail. I just thought it made for a fascinating picture. So it's a smartphone picture. Sea smoke, as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago. Um, does The conditions around here don't happen very often, but if you pay any attention to the weather forecast, there's no reason you can't position yourself, ready yourself to get out there and, and capitalize on these really fascinating uh, conditions, really really, really neat images with sea smoke. Fog can be a wonderful, uh, can make for a wonderful picture. This is uh, the Newburyport waterfront a number of years ago, middle of the winter. Actually, that wouldn't have been winter. But anyway, fog is a great time to be, a, a great context to be shooting in. Uh, again, here, this scene looks very, very different when there isn't fog rolling through this scene. One thing I wanted to point out here, and this is a, one of those classic comparative, do this and then do this. Same tree in the background. That's a, it's an amazing tree in a pasture in Ronsford, New Hampshire. We photograph it for years, every all different times of the year. But what I did in this case, remember that foreground interest or that foreground anchor point I mentioned to create the sense of depth? Well, that's what this little tree in the foreground is doing. Envision this picture without that tree on the left side it would look very, very different. The image would look very different. The other thing I'm doing here is I wanna encourage you, most of us take pictures that are horizontal or landscape orientation, right? Flip your camera 90 degrees, no matter what you're shooting, remember to flip your camera 90 degrees and take a vertical. Sometimes the picture that you find in the vertical is more compelling or powerful than the picture that you took in a landscape orientation. So again, just a little trick. Doesn't, you know, obviously this is not a winter tip. This is something you can do any time of the year, wherever you are, but two very different pictures. And in fact, the second one here where that very tall, narrow, skinny tree works much better because of its shape in a vertical orientation. This is a gimmick. 
but it's a powerful gimmick. If you like playing with software, if you like editing images on a computer, you can create something called a stitched panorama. In other words, when you're pointing your camera at a scene, obviously there's just so much real estate then a single exposure is going to record. So if you want to if you want to shoot a wider or taller scene, you can actually create that image by taking a series of overlapping exposures. Okay? So what I'm showing you here, let's see how many do I have? 10 10 images, 10 vertical exposures. I took these about a month and a half ago up at the Queechy Dam in Vermont. It's a very small space, very, very fascinating space. And I wanted to capture the entire thing. In order to capture the entire left to right scene, and I wanted to take vertical pictures so I could capture a lot of the vertical space, I had to shoot 10 images moving left to right. Each exposure is overlapped by at least 30% better to have it be 50% because the computer is then going to take all of these images, looking at the math, the overlapping pixels, and blend them together. And this is what I got. Fascinating. That's what my eyeball saw. There's no way a single picture captured with my camera could have conveyed this. Now, would this be the endpoint? So this is called a stitched panorama. You can do it in Photoshop. You can do it on a whole range of different software packages. It's a little gimmicky, but I would say not really. It creates a really interesting image. And it's the only way you're going to get an image like this. I would, If I were going to make a print of this image, I would then crop it because obviously it's got very irregular edges. But I left it this way just because I like the way it looked and I'm not framing it. So digital stitching. Moving on, you can shoot clouds any time of the year. Endlessly fascinating. You can shoot the moon. If you have a 70 to 300 millimeter zoom lens, you can shoot the moon on a tripod. You do need to have the camera on a tripod and you need a fast shutter speed. But with a 300 millimeter lens, you can shoot a picture of the moon. I've done it. I like, this was actually a handheld, which is why it's kind of fuzzy. This was a handheld smartphone picture. Uh, I have a kind of an expensive, and I will say overpriced, Samsung Android cell phone that actually has a 10X optical zoom, which allowed me to get this close to the moon. It's incredible. Um, it's, it's a little fuzzy, but I did that with a smartphone. Again, shooting the moon, a moon rise in this case, a couple of summers ago. Again, you can do these in the winter, you can do these in the summer. What I'm really trying to show you, convey to you, is it doesn't matter what time of the year it is. There's all sorts of great things in nature that you can photograph. I love the way the setting sun energized the windows in that lobster boat. This one's a little fuzzy. I think I picked the wrong one. But anyway, um, sort of a framed sunrise of Parker River National Wildlife Refuge using one of the boardwalks. And again, the edge of the sea is just endlessly changeable and changing. And just amazing what you can shoot down there. This is probably my favorite sunrise shot <clears throat> in my 12 years of Parker River. But I cheated here. This is very surreal looking, but I like it. It's called a high dynamic range image. A high dynamic range image. What does that mean? What I did here is I had the camera on a tripod and I shoot, shot multiple exposures. I shot the same picture multiple times, but at different light levels. So if you can remember back when I was talking about changing the exposure compensation. By flipping that dial, you can make an image lighter or darker. There's actually software that will allow you to take multiple exposures of the same scene from bright to dark, bring them together in software and it'll create something surreal looking like this. That's how I created that image and I really like it. Many images in winter, actually look better in black and white. 
again, this is from Parker River. It's just a, a bony tree poking through the sun, poking through the snow on, a, on the edge of a dune. Um, patterns and texture in nature. Midwinter. Let's talk about more patterns and textures and shapes and abstracts. What I liked about this was just sort of that very stringy, textured, almost looked like spaghetti to me, the, the way the, uh, the dune grass was covered with that frosty snow, texture patterns, um, texture patterns. Dendritic patterns recorded in the sand. Endlessly fascinating. Lichens on tree bark. I love this. Smartphone image. Pine bark, believe it or not. How pretty is that? Fungus on a log gradually being revealed by the melting back of the snow. Again, more patterns in the sand. I think this was taken at Sandy Point on Plum Island. You can get really, really close, particularly with a smartphone. Ever got down on your knees and try to get really close to barnacles on a rock? I like this, I, thought, I think it's fascinating. These are animals, by the way. There's just kind of a majestic flow. Almost reminds me of a ballet dancer. Don't ask me why. The way this uh, driftwood is sort of revealing itself up from underneath a, a blanket of snow. A very, very intricate pattern. Repeated pattern of twigs, tree branches covered in snow. This must have been a sewer crate or something similar somewhere. I just really like the pattern. Drifting snow on one of the impoundments of Parker River. I added a little oil paint filter to this one, which is why it looks a little ethereal. And I just really like the shape of the, how the snow was drifting into these wisps and waves on the ice. Talking about winter landscapes, <clears throat> endlessly fascinating. If you can find some calm water, you'll get some really cool reflections. These are some images just from the last month or so. We've had a lot of these overcast days. You get a lot of overcast days. Again, intuitively think, I don't wanna go outside and take pictures on an overcast day. I'm not really gonna get anything pretty. Well, yes, you will. You just gotta look for the right sort of scene. Uh, this is one of, this is our backyard. This is one of those more recent snowstorms we had. All I had to do was open the sliding glass door and take a picture with a smartphone. It was gorgeous out there. Uh, one of the compositional techniques that you can employ in your landscape image making is using something called a leading line. And I probably don't have to tell you anything more about the power of a leading line that's showing you this picture. Again, another boardwalk at Parker River. Um, this will guide your eyes, guaranteed, from the lower right portion of this image, trailing off into the upper left. You don't really have any choice. It moves you through the image. You can use this to great effect. Um, this image, a, a, a very stormy looking beachscape. There are lots of leading lines here. There's the, the uh, tidal uh, impressions in the sand. There's the edge of the water. There's the horizon. There's the, uh, the cloud line. There's just lots of lines going on in this very dynamic yet pretty static uh, landscape. Just a lot of texture going on here in this uh, image taken from a boardwalk at Parker River uh, over the, uh, the dune lands. There's that tree again from Rollinsford, New Hampshire. Shooting in a driving snow obviously creates a very, very different look. Just a couple of weeks ago, this is a smartphone picture in a, of a river right down the street where we live here. Water was very still, so the re reflections were very detailed. And again, 
Uh, you have leading lines happening in this in this image, um, the way the uh, the two shorelines are moving into the background, sort of that V shape. Uh, pull your eyes into the scene. Uh, this driftwood is acting as a form of leading line in this image. This is a picture taken a little bit ago at a, at a beach up here in Agunquit. And that uh, boat in the lower left, which of course I placed there on purpose, is one of those foreground anchor points I was talking to you about. Gives the image a, an added sense of depth. Back to driving snow and trees. By the way, notice that I chose not to put this tree right in the middle of the frame. Many times your images will be far more compelling compositionally if you offset your uh, main subject, which of course is this big tree, to one or the other side of, of the frame. Leading lines, very dominant leading line created by the refuge road as it goes by that famous grove of sassafras trees on the National Wildlife Refuge. This may be my personal favorite winter shot uh, that I took at Parker River over 12 winters there. I just love this image. It was miserable weather. The more miserable, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Nobody else would, would be out there. Late in the day, wind was howling. It was probably 10 or five degrees. And I just I came upon this scene on the beach and I just thought it was so elegant. Um, this punch of color provided by the, uh, uh, by the lobster pots, the yellow in particular, in contrast to that cobalt or or slate gray sky. I just really, really like this image. And there's some strong leading lines in it. That's a really powerful vibe. More patterns in the snow um, on an impoundment at Parker River. A lot of depth in this picture. Here's another example of flipping your camera 90 degrees. I'm not sure which one I like better, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. I think I like the, the landscape or the wide frame better than the vertical. But sometimes you don't know until you get them on your computer. So recapping some landscape tips. Make sure your horizon line is level, folks. If you have a horizon line in your image, all landscapes will have a horizon line. If it's not perfectly level, it's not going to work. That image will drive you nuts. There's something about have, not having a level line that makes it really, really important. Horizon lines should also be placed either a roughly a third of the way down from the top or a third of the way up from the bottom, almost never uh, directly cutting the vertical frame in half. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. There's just something about, about it. It doesn't look quite right. The one case where it does look all right, and you saw a couple of images here, if something is being reflected in a body of water. If you have that classic mountain range picture uh, with the mountain range being reflected in the lake in front of the mountain range, then that uh, middle horizon line can look okay. In general though, try to keep it either up toward the top or down toward the bottom. We talked a lot about adding foreground interest, whether it's a human, an animal, a rock, a tree or whatever. And typically with landscape pictures, you want a deep depth of field. Not always the case, but generally speaking, a landscape image has a, everything is sharp front to back. That's what a deep depth of field means. How do you achieve that? Technically with a camera setting, by using the smallest aperture or a very small aperture, that will give you a deep depth of field. On the other hand, if you want just a, one area to be sort of sharp and the rest of it fuzzy front to back, that's where you would use a wide aperture. So these are you know photo fundamentals, but they're worth repeating here. And like I said, consider shooting both horizontally and vertically. You may be pleasantly surprised. Let's talk briefly about smartphone photography, the strengths. They're really good. Cam these smartphones are really getting very, very good as cameras in general, but they do really well with landscapes and super close up. If you wanna get really, really close to something like that snail on the ground I talked about, use your smartphone. It's amazing how close it will let you get. Um, the good thing about having a smartphone is you're going to have it with you. How many of us have been, all of a sudden we find ourselves with this amazing scene that we want to photograph 
and doggone it, the camera is nowhere to be seen. It's at home. It's not in the car. Chances are you're going to have your smartphone. So that's really the good news with a smartphone and how good they are as cameras. Limitations, they're not very good at telephoto photography. Yes, the Samsung I have, which is only a year old, has a 10x optical zoom. Very few smartphones have that. But here's the, here's the bad news. It's not very good. The 10X optical zoom is not very good. It works, but it gives me very sort of weird looking pictures. They also don't do really well in lower light. Um, now that's changing and getting better all the time, but because the digital image sensor is so tiny in a smartphone relative to the size of an image center in a real camera, it doesn't handle low light really well. You tend to get noisy looking pictures, pictures that have a lot of speckles or, or pixelated. Um, again, it's getting better all the time, but that's definitely true with pretty much every smartphone right now. Amazing video. Smartphones shoot. Um, if you have a, a recent phone, well, it's four or five years, it shoots killer video. So don't forget that. Um, and what's really cool about a smartphone is you have both the camera and the image editor built into the same device. And I'll show an example of that in a minute. There are certain pieces of adjunctive equipment, uh, accessories that you might want to consider getting for your smartphone. First and foremost is a bracket that you attach to your tripod that will allow you your tripod to hold the camera. I have that, I use it all the time, uh, and it's really worth having. Uh, a wireless remote trigger. So in other words, you can set up your, and I've done this, you can put your camera, your smartphone in the bracket on the tripod outside in front of the bird feeding station, come into the sunroom, wait for the birds to show up, and I can start taking lots of pictures and video remotely. I couldn't get away with that standing next to the tripod in front of the bird feeder. So a $5 remote trigger, which will work with any smartphone, is worth getting. There's a range of add-on lenses. I won't bother getting into that. In general, though, I always counsel people, whether we're talking about cameras or smartphone cameras, to set the device to record the highest quality image it's capable of recording. Here's why. If you have, a, have your camera or your smartphone set to record a relatively low quality image, an image that will look great on Facebook, that will look fine on a computer screen, but it doesn't have enough information to print it. So I always counsel people to set their image quality really high because there's always the chance that a picture you take, you're going to be so turned onto it that you want to make a print. If you're going to print a photograph, you need a lot of information. You need a big file size. That's why I recommend people set their cameras, including smartphone cameras, to record high quality images. OK, uh, real quick, there are a couple of apps that you can use if you like to know where the sun is going to set or where the moon is going to rise or what date and time and where uh, you need to be to shoot the uh, galactic center of the Milky Way. And that's a huge genre of photography right now, which is why I mentioned it. There's a couple of apps that are really, really good. And I have them both that you can put on your smartphone and they'll give you all that information. One is called the Photographer's Ephemeris. They both have weird names. The other one is called Photo Pills. And these are amazing little software programs that'll tell you all sorts of information about shooting the moon, the sun, the Milky Way, et cetera. So look into that if you want to. If you like editing images on a smartphone, I always push Snapseed. It's free, it's very intuitive, it's very powerful. It's owned by Google. Sometimes I think I'm owned by Google. And uh, you can load it on either an iPhone or an Android. It'll work on both. Snapseed, very easy to learn. Now, here's an example of why smartphones can be so powerful. 
So you take a picture, whatever, wherever you are, you take a picture, literally within about a minute or two, you've edited that picture. Most pictures need editing or can benefit from editing. So I took a picture, I edited the picture, let's say in a minute and a half, and within three minutes, that edited picture, which I took three minutes earlier, is on Facebook or is on Instagram and can be viewed by anybody on the planet with a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone. That's what I mean by the entire digital workflow from taking a picture to editing the picture to publishing the picture can all be done on the same device in the palm of your hands. I find that fascinating. Smartphones and bird photography. There are, here are some of the devices that I've used and you can see the brackets, right? That are holding the smartphones in these three images. And in that image on the right, you see that little $5, and I mean literally $5 remote control uh, that I use to control my smartphone from a remote location like inside the sunroom uh, when the smartphone is trained on the bird feeder, for example. So all sorts of devices to get that, just like with a camera, to get the device out of your hands. And there we have it. There's that smartphone a couple of years ago in a bracket on top of a tripod trained on our feeding station in the backyard. Triggered by my Bluetooth remote. This is what it looked like, super wide angle. And these birds could have cared less. They really could have cared less. I mean, the audacity of that bluebird to stand on top of my iPhone. I couldn't get over it. But <clears throat> this is just a, you know, a simulation to show you how powerful this technology can be for cap capturing compelling images of wildlife. All done with a smartphone. Not the most naturalistic setting, I will admit. I was just trying to demonstrate this, but I love this one. So finally, the power of magical thinking. This is kind of funny. My wife and I were down in Norwich, Connecticut in a cemetery several years ago, looking up some of her uh, relatives who are buried in that uh, place. And Anne kept staring at this, uh, this hole in this nearby tree in the graveyard and she she was she just swore she was seeing a screech owl right she even got me convinced that she was seeing a screech owl so we both took pictures of this screech owl and when we got home and put those images of that screech owl on the computer it turned out not to be a screech owl at all the one on the right is a screech owl that we took somewhere else but it was just kind of funny and humbling. There's just something about the, uh, the, nod, the knotty wood in the back of that opening in that tree that uh, when you're way back, and we were way back, it, doggone it, that's got to be a screech owl. Well, it was kind of a humbling experience. So in any event, I don't have a clock in front of me, but typically this runs about, yep, and it did, a little over 90 minutes. And I'm done yakking at you. So at this point, I'm gonna get out of the, uh, the PowerPoint, stop sharing. And uh, 43 of you are here. Holy smokes, Batman. So <clears throat> I wanna thank you all for hanging with me uh, this long. But if you have any questions, now is the time. Now let me go up here. I'm going to put my John Denver glasses on so I can actually read the comments. Let's see. Uh, okay. I'm curious about digital trail cameras mounted to capture wildlife. Yes, trail cameras are super fun. Uh, everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I've got one out in the tree right now outside the house here. They're wonderful. And you don't have to spend a lot of money. You can get one for 50 or 60 bucks. So trail cameras can be a lot of fun. Um, whether you, you bait, you can't do this in a refuge, but oftentimes I'll, you know, if it's in my yard, I'll put some cat food on the ground and try to pull something in that way. Um, do you keep your polarizer filter on all the time? You know, I used to have the polarizer on all the time. 
and I've gotten lazy just in the last year or so. It's really not on all the time. But if I know I'm really good, uh, if I'm in a situation where I'm going to benefit from the use of a circular polarizer, it's in the camera bag and I can easily whip it out. Uh, oh, Ella's talking about Felix. Hi, Ella. Um, when you are out there trying to photograph, do you usually set up your camera in a good spot? Or do you wait for something interesting to show up? I am not a huge wildlife photographer. I shoot everything. Um, so there aren't too many situations where I personally go to a destination and set up a tripod and sit there for hours. I'm not very patient for one thing, but yeah, uh, people that shoot birds, I mean, they'll, they'll go and set up in a blind and sit there for hours. I mean, they'll get there in the dark before anything's even around. So again, depending on what it is you're photographing, um, for one thing, it helps to have a lot of patience. Some of us don't. And uh, the more time you spend developing this craft, the better at it you're gonna be. But don't forget what I said earlier, the more you know about these animals and their behavior, the less time you're gonna waste trying to find them. That's absolutely true. Can you repeat what you said about changing the ISO for low light conditions? Yes. It's this simple. Uh, the darker the lighting conditions are, the higher you're going to need your ISO. The lower the light situation, the higher the ISO should be. You don't want to elevate the ISO any higher than you have to, because the downside of it is the higher the ISO goes, the more grain or pixelization you're going to get your images. Camera technology is getting better all the time, but we're still not to a point where you don't have to worry about what's called digital noise at super highest ISO levels. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, let's see, thank you very much. Do you have any tips for when to spot bald eagles and or loons? Well, like I said, uh, there, there was a, a bunch of loons in Rockland Harbor yesterday. They're not in the interior right now. They spend the winters out on the coast. Many of you will know that already. Bald eagles, they're everywhere. Um, they're already around here starting to build their nests or add to the nests that they had in the prior year. We actually were driving down to a gas station in Rollinsburg yesterday, uh, actually last week. And as we were heading over the New Hampshire border, a bald eagle flew right by the car over the gas station into a tree behind the gas station. Uh, I mean, they're literally everywhere. They're almost as common as, not quite as common as pigeons, but they're pretty common. Does anybody, let's see if there are any other questions here. Yeah, somebody's saying, uh, Eunice, that there's nothing wrong with hand holding a camera, by the way. I'm a bit of a purist and I was taught this way. If you're, everything's relative. If you wanna optimize your sharpness, get the camera out of your hands. Um, just do it, it's that simple. That doesn't mean that you can't shoot images by holding the camera. I do it all the time. I'm just preaching. So if you wanna optimize, that's what you do. So hopefully you didn't uh, take what I was saying the wrong way. Let's see everybody else. All right, unless anybody has any questions and I'm not going anywhere. But uh, if anybody has any questions that you want to unmute yourself and ask, please do. Otherwise, we will uh, bring this thing to a close. I appreciate everybody spending time here with me tonight. And again, don't forget, this is the Merrimack River Eagle Festival week. And there are other things happening uh, from now through the 18th. And you can get online and check out that schedule uh, there. How's that? Matt, and I don't, I don't mind. Go ahead, Graham. You know, whoever's trying to talk to me, go ahead. Yeah, it's Graham. Uh, Matt, yeah. have you used a, uh, like a zoom type stabilizer at all? I've been using a zoom, right a, a zoom, 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 zoom uh, -E. or Zion. No, I have not have not. How's that? They're very, very handy. They're very handy, especially I like to have a, a tremor. And uh, if you use the uh, Zion type stabilizer with a phone, 
Yeah. Uh, it, it just it just levels it right out. I used oh, it interesting. for making a professional website type picture, and it worked very, very well. So this is like a gyroscopic thing that, yes. that levels everything? Yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. Like a gimbal. That's the word yeah, I was... Yeah, it's a gimbal. And it's really a gimbal. It's handy if you, have, if you shake it at all. Yeah. Yeah, I'm aware of gimbals. I haven't purchased one, I, but I fully recognize the value of having one. So thank you for mentioning that. You're Anybody welcome. else? Anybody else? All right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, on behalf of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, the Massachusetts Audubon Society, thank you for joining us here and go out and take pictures. And maybe winter will come back. I took my first bike ride today in 53 degrees, which felt pretty good. But if you love winter, it's been kind of a bummer. In any event, uh, have a good night. Uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll see you around.